Friday, the 29th of April. I'm here. My name is Brian Clary. I've got Teresa Racer, Dan, Casey, Kim, and Buffy. And we're here with Spectral Research Investigations and Mimi Paranormal. And tonight we're doing the Glenn Ferris Inn. Glenn Ferris Inn. The original structure on this or on this land built sometime between 1810 and 1815. Records indicate that it was built in 1815 by two Irish unnamed brothers. Um, the property originally was probably a single family home and it, as time went on it was added on to. The Stockton family, Aaron Stockton was from New Jersey. He came down from New Jersey into the Kanawha Valley at a time when this area was very much in its infancy and bought this property. And in 1837, he opened officially or got registered for his license, for his liquor license and opened this as the Stockton Tavern. It's been in the Stockton family. Um, for quite some time after that, up until about 1920. Now, after Aaron Stockton and his wife, Elizabeth, passed away, it went down through the family, and it mainly returned back to a single family residence, but it was still located on a major thoroughfare through this area in West Virginia. And that's originally why the Stockton Tavern or Stockton Inn open to guests to take advantage of all of the new traffic coming down the James what is now River. the James River Turnpike, which is now Route 60. Mm -hmm. But when the traffic started to kind of clear up a little bit, it was largely turned back into a single family residence. And the family though, this was a large house and they built onto it. They continued to build onto it even up until like 1915. So they would open it up for passers-by, workers in the area who needed a place to stay. Um, it operated under the Hawkins Hotel briefly. What was one of some of the other names? The, the Stockton, Inn, Stockton Inn, the Hawkins Hotel. The White House Tavern was the original name that I was able to find from 1850. They built on this whole section that's to my right. Um, it was largely used as dormitories for single men, and then the nicer rooms were used to host different dignitaries and higher ups in the company who would come to this area. In this area we have a lot of different things that are kind of contributing to the stories that we have heard with this location. So 1933 the Hawks Nest Tunnel just up the road a little ways uh, there was an explosion during the process of building it. A lot of people were killed in the process. I think it was like 50 people if memory serves me from what I remember in the notes. The Civil War Camp Reynolds was right across the river from where we are now. Camp Reynolds was the hub for the Union Army during the 1861-1862 Kanawha Valley Campaign. Um, some of the research that I indicated talked about the 12th Ohio Regiment being right across the river. Uh, amongst the Ohio regiments that were actually stationed in this area was a man that would have become president, a man by the name of Rutherford B. Hayes. Also, John Tyler, if memory serves me, he was here. This location has reportedly played host to John Tyler, Rutherford B. Hayes, Andrew Jackson, Thomas Jefferson, and a lot of well-known dignitaries, folks like um, Henry Clay, Albert Gallatin Jenkins, and then Henry Wise, who was the governor of Virginia back in the 1850s, right around the time that James Buchanan was in office. So we had a lot of Civil War stories that go along with this location. Mr. Stockton himself is very well known as a political contributor, but also a wealthy entrepreneur in this region who was involved in the salt industry, the coal industry, the steel industry. He was involved in a little bit of everything here along the river. He also had slaves in the period before the Civil War. Um, we also had 
just going through some general research, we found stuff in Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, in Charleston, in various newspapers, in federal archives and stuff like that of the Stockton family, and then the general area that we're talking about. Now, there's not a lot of documentation of this location specifically. There's one reported death that is can be attributed to this building, and that is? Aaron Stockton himself um, when he passed away in 1869. So as far as kind of the ghost stories go, most of the ghost stories tend to focus on the Civil War era. And there's two main apparitions that are seen. And the first one is a gentleman that witnesses describe as being some sort of Confederate general of some sort. And they call him the Colonel. So the story goes that if you drop the F-bomb in that kitchen, the Colonel is gonna throw and break a plate. But I think he also likes to knock down some pots and pans. We were back in the Riverside dining room. The lights were off, so I couldn't see him. And I could hear like something pushing him like I could hear his shoes scuffing up so I'm looking back I'm like what are you doing and he's like something pushing me back I'm like my gosh he he said that there was like some kind of dark spirit back there that did not like him in room 102 there was uh, an incident that a man and his wife came um, to stay and when they walked up to the desk to uh, check in right off the bat the gentleman said is this place haunted so his wife reached over and kind of smacked him on the arm and he she said don't start that and he said she doesn't believe in this stuff but I do and I said oh okay so of course I wasn't going to go in with with my story and um, anyway the next morning they came out, was getting ready to check out, and he said, "Ask, called her by name and said, come over and tell her what you experienced. And during the night, she said she was um, woken by what she felt was someone staring at her. So she opened her eyes and sat up, and there was a man standing there with her or at, looking at her, and he had a um, military hat, uniform, and the whole nine yards on. Had a long white beard, and she said he was just standing there looking at her. So she just kind of froze. She didn't know what to do. And she said by the time she got her husband aw awake, he had just disappeared into the door. Which is interesting because Aaron Stockton's nickname was the Colonel. Now, he didn't actually attain that rank legally through his military service. Um, he did briefly serve in the military, but not to the rank of colonel. During the mid-1800s, tavern owners were often called colonel. Mm -hmm. So we know that it's probably not him that people are seeing because you, you want to give a description of <laughs> poor Colonel Stockton? <laughs> so... Historic reports of Colonel Stockton are less than kind. Um, he is reported as being as wide as he is tall. Um, he was, one of the descriptions that Teresa had was that his stomach would arrive in a location before he would. Um, now the reports of the Colonel spirit that we're talking about is usually of a very tall, slender man with a long scraggly gray beard, usually wearing what is believed to be a Confederate uniform. It really doesn't match with the reports of what we think the Colonel would have looked like. Now, one of the theories that Teresa and I have kind of talked about and some of the other stories that we've talked to other folks about is that it is possible that this was Albert Gallatin Jenkins, who was a well-known Confederate officer in this time. They used to run up and down the James River Turnpike with his various cavalry units during the 1861-1862 campaigns. And it is highly likely at some point that he passed through if did not stay in this location. 
And it also makes sense because he would have known Aaron Stockton quite well. Um, Aaron Stockton, you know, was a, a Democrat of before the war between the states. He was a Confederate sympathizer. And so he and, uh, you know, later General Jenkins, um, they attended quite a few Congress meetings to get, you know, conferences together in Parkersburg about secession issues. Um, but we're not entirely sure if it is Jenkins or not. No. It could be a number of people. Because one of the other stories that we keep hearing is that at one point when Camp Reynolds was across the street and there was troop movement through this area, that the inn was used as a makeshift hospital. And we don't have any official records of it, but that does make a lot of sense because any time that you had a lot of troops gathered in one place, there was going to be illness, there was going to be sickness, injuries, and they were looking to overtake any building that was big enough to handle it. So there are stories that not only was this a quartermaster's depot, but it was also used as the makeshift hospital. Um, so our colonel could be any number of you know soldiers that were brought here and perhaps passed away. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings us to our second major apparition who was seen, and she's the lady in white. The lady and her mother were staying here, and she said about dusk one night, she had got up to look at the view, she said, and supposedly when they checked in, there was nobody here. And she looked out there, and she said there was a woman sitting on that bench right there, in a white dress. So she walked downstairs and says, there's a lady out there sitting on the bench in a white dress, you know, it's, what room is she in, in case we happen to run into her or we speak to her. Mm -hmm. And she said, there's nobody here. So I say, come back up, she's still there. So she went back. Then they, the lady at the desk walked outside with her, gone. So the lady in white that has been reported here is usually seen in one of two locations either on the stairwell out here to the front of the building or in the back of the building on a bench facing the river. Okay. Um, through our historical records searches, there was no real common theme that I can find in terms of who this lady would have been. Like I said, there was only one reported death in this location. It doesn't mean, obviously, that some other spiritual attachment did not happen here. There was a story that this lady actually had her kids and she was a worker here, I believe was the story. She was a housekeeper and she had her kids. And one of the stories that we were told when we were here the first time was that she was walking down the uh, Route 60 at this point and going to church, I believe, or a church service just down the road and went down across a bridge and something happened with like the child fell off the bridge or the bridge fell underneath them or something. It was a passenger bridge and the child drowned. And one of the stories is that she still roams the building looking for her child. And there have been reports of her out back um, looking at the river, stay, uh, sitting on a bench out back at the hotel looking at the river. Now there's a theory that she was a Civil War nurse and to me personally, um, at the, during the Civil War, nurses did not want to wear white because it was a dirty, dirty time. And so, you know, Florence Nightingale, it's, her recommendations were that everybody wear dark clothing if you worked as a nurse. So I'm not completely sold that she was a nurse. Now I have a personal theory that I believe that she may have been Mrs. Stockton, Elizabeth Stockton. Um, because Elizabeth Stockton, she had several children. Now, her daughters grew up, married, you know, their families continued in the area. But she also had two sons, and one son um, was killed during the Civil War. But then the second son, we're not sure the exact date, but it said that he was drowned in the New River. Well, actually, you know, we've had some experiences with the woman in white ourselves. You want to mm -hmm. talk about your... So, family? the first time that we came here, we we were coming in from getting equipment outside and came up the little walkway up here and there was a lady looking out of the window which Casey and Dan are spending the night in, lucky them. Um, and then I believe it was James that said James he up. saw her up on the balcony right above us up here on the uh, second floor balcony above the dining room. We were all in here sitting um, 
and he had walked outside. We could see him out through the window. I thought he was just waving. He was like <laughs> frantically like trying to get our attention so we could yeah. come out there and see it. Then we had several other things happen the last time. We had what we thought what might have been a child messing with us, playing with equipment, pulling uh, the Kestrel that I usually carry around me, the piece of weather equipment on my neck in a way that caught my attention immediately up in the bridal suite. Um, we had a curtain move that looked like it was being held back and then when eyes locked on it, it went back to normal. We had some sounds, some things happened in the past time. Still back there. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other stories. There's stories in one of the rooms that there is a sheet that will come up and it will tickle the person's feet. Um, the colonel is seen in room 208. Um, he, seen in room 102. Yeah, well. he will usually be sitting in a chair and then he'll walk across the room or walk through the door or something or through the wall. I believe it was the story that we heard. So there's a lot of reports with this location that goes back many, many years. Although this location is not particularly, did you hear that? Yeah, and I saw something. All right, we're indoors, so a lot of this stuff is gonna be manipulated. Temperature in here right now is 70.7 degrees. Yeah. Wind chill, 7.9. Humidity, 46%. Um, 2.49.3. I wish we could figure out a way to turn the audio off. Hey, Dan, do you think you can remember where that handprint was? <laughs> say that word because I'm not helping. Not. Not that? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. So what do you need help with? Be careful. Be careful for what? Are we in danger? Stop recording. I don't want to stop recording. Really? If we stop recording, will you show yourself? That's what I heard. That's why it sounded like. I need a clear yes and I'll stop recording. Breaking point. Breaking point. He's at his breaking point. He's tired of us. Quit hiding in the dark and come in here and tell us. I'm not going anywhere, otherwise. Basement. There's no basement here. So I don't know. It says that there is, I don't think it's any longer a hospital, but I think that's where the actual hospital is. I don't think it's ever been that way. Okay. Again. I 
heard forget it. Forget it, maybe. Let me get so testy. What? What does she want? Bite. Bite. No biting. A child. Can you tell me what color bunny you like best? The white one or the brown one? Oh, the brown one. Trying to pick it up. Okay. Hey. Stockton, are you here with us this evening? <clears throat> Colonel Stockton, did you know Albert Jenkins? His home is right up the road from me. Colonel Stockton, were you a fan of James Buchanan? Did you cast your vote? I know you had, uh, you were an elector for Raleigh County and Fayette County. Is that true? If so, did you cast your vote for James Buchanan in 1856? Or did you cast your vote for John C. Fremont, that free soiler? And I know how you felt about free soilers. Do not. Do not. Do not what? Are you saying that you did not vote for him? Battle. battle. There was a battle here at Golly Bridge. Is that what you're talking about? Where the Union Army pushed out the Confederates for the last time and took control of the Kanawha Valley? I think that was 1862. Goodbye. Are you actually innocent? Warm.